Hi, my name is Ken Varnell, and I'm here in Green Springs, Arkansas, to talk about the porcelain pottery of Steve Beecham, available here at Zarks Gallery. Steve Beecham works exclusively in porcelain, which was first made in China around the late 2nd century. In fact, porcelain is so closely associated with China that people still refer to expensive dishes as fine china, no matter where it came from. Porcelain is made from a higher quality clay than other ceramics, such as stoneware, terracotta, and earthenware, and it's also fired at the highest temperature. Today, Steve invited me into his studio at Spring Street Pottery for Porcelain 101. Clay is one of the mediums that uh, really does survive, so whether it's Sumerian pottery that you're looking at or whatever. Uh, Gary Agan, the master potter here, actually had a master's degree in uh, art, and that was how he became a potter. Well, I just came over here for vacation and didn't leave. But when I started as a potter, I was actually, I basically did the apprentice thing, and I wedged clay for Gary and sat and watched him work, and... Uh, uh, <laughs> Wedging is probably the least fun. Just getting the clay, just the grunt work of preparing the the clay for throwing. And this is where the term throwing comes from. You literally throw the piece. Now I'm mashing from the top and the sides to try to shape this ball into a small this cylinder. This is called opening the clay. And when you open the clay, especially with porcelain, you've got about three chances to get your ultimate shape. But what I'm doing is feeling between one hand fingers and the other hand's fingers and kind of, I can sort of guesstimate what the thickness is of the piece, kind of evening up, moving up the piece, form a little bit of a foot by pushing in, and then I'm going to pull the bowl shape in its final look. And on a lot of this decoration, I'll have some idea of what I want it to look like, but a lot of, I mean, everything that I do here is one of a kind. So let me twist the trunk, kind of a weathered look to it. With pottery, you want to do. Uh, Asymmetry is a, a big part of what makes something interesting. This is the uh, greenware shelves, and when a piece is completed, it comes out here and is put on these shelves to dry. So they sit out here sometimes for a week or 10 days until they're um, as dry as they can possibly be, just air drying. And then from this stage, the clay or the pieces go into this kiln which is an electric kiln and the bisque firing is uh, hard it makes the pieces hard enough that they can be dipped into the liquid glazes probably the most popular glaze I do is called rutile and uh, it's it's the most volatile glaze I do and you can kind of see this is how it looks when I finish glazing it, and this is how it looks when it, when it finishes firing. Uh, it's called a reduction uh, kiln. So there's this air and flame moving around in the kiln all the time. Certain parts of the kiln than they do in other parts. Um, it's, it's a very difficult process. The part that I'm doing right now where I actually am taking the um, the throne piece and applying the decoration and just really making it exactly what I want it to look like and and I almost feel this tree you know coming to life as I'm as I'm working on it and I, I think that's probably the most fun part. For the critical analysis requirement of this assignment I decided to use a semiotic approach to analyze a picture created by Steve similar to the one that he was working on during our interview. 
As a student of linguistics and anthropology, I thought that using this approach would be a good test of my skills in interpreting symbolic systems and cultural motifs. A pitcher signifies a vessel for collecting, holding, and distributing beverages, and since all beverages directly reference water, all pitchers likewise reference water as well. This particular pitcher's relationship to water is further reinforced by its composition and color. Its rounded shape, its gentle curves, its rippled mouth suggest pouring even when the pitcher is empty. The glazes drip in hues of blue, white, and purple, such as a waterfall or swelling tide. All these elements unite in the pitcher to clearly convey the symbolism of water and all the connotations of water. Refreshment, renewal, nourishment, life. Few symbols are as tied to the idea of life. However, the composition has more to say. The handle of the pitcher is a cypress tree. For thousands of years in the West, we've associated cypress trees with funerals, graveyards, the underworld, and death. This historical association is further accentuated by the gnarled, twisted shape of the tree itself. The top of the tree has even been broken off. It's weathered and battered, and look what it clings to the voluptuous blue symbol of life. You'll notice also that the tree is gilded. Now what does the gold mean in this context? Gold signifies material wealth, but as you can see, wealth has not kept this tree from becoming broken and decrepit. Do you see how the only leaves on the tree are the ones in direct contact with the pitcher? This piece is a proverb, and it can be translated, all the gold in the world cannot buy you eternal life. Steve's compositions tend to be simple and elegant with a conscious asymmetrical balance, though he often adds whimsical touches like frogs, dragons, and gilded weather-beaten cedar trees in the style of his mentor Gary Agin. For me, however, color is the real star of the show, and it's the reason I'm such a big fan. For much the same reason that I like the Impressionists and the Expressionists. The way he mixes different colored glazes reminds me of the way in which the Impressionists mix colors. Uh, the patterns on his work also remind me of the Expressionists as well. Thanks again to Steve Beecham for all he taught me today.